One argument that Andy Stern, who's uh, stepping down as the president of SEIU, has made is he, he said flat out in a, in a speech, and it really slapped people like me who come out of industrial plants. He said, you guys in industrial plants have to give it up. He said, you're not going to keep them here in the United States. The minute you try to organize them, they will leave. They will go to China. They will go to Mexico. They will go to Sri Lanka or anywhere else. He said, what you have to do is you have to organize those workers who cannot move. So SEIU has gone out of its way to target health care workers in America, public sector workers in America, and folks in the service sector, specifically uh, janitors in large buildings, hotels, and other things in that way. So one big argument about the future, if organizing is, is really what we're going to uh, stake our future on, is the fact that you have to organize those that have no mobility because if they have mobility, they will use the mobility they have. Now again, Kitty put her finger right on it. It's about contracting out, subcontracting, outsourcing, and everything else. The public sector has found a wonderful way to get rid of its obligation to unionize workers by running right out from under them, by subcontracting the work, outsourcing it, and by using contract labor firms, uh, both in the private and public sector, where they are now regarded under law to be the employer rather than the actual group that truly uh, gives them direction and employs them. So there's a lot of nuances, unfortunately, within labor law. It's all about the weasel words, and uh, the weasel words are not necessarily on our side right now. Uh, now, changing the law. All of us have advocated changing the law, like I said. Some of us have been advocating it since the late 70s and moving forward, and it's a tough uphill battle. It doesn't mean that you don't try to do it. But I would ask the question, how necessary is the law? Because in reality, power trumps law every time. You heard about that in relation to the 1937 Workers' Holiday here in Lansing. You know, if, uh, if four people try to parade without a permit, they get arrested. If 4,000 people try to do it, they have a parade. And I think one thing that has happened over time is that we have forgotten that what really worries the boss is not the fact that we are legally protected in what we do. What worries the boss is the fact that people will stand up and together have a voice. And so in that way, any type of actual organizing, people standing up, doing the things that matter, I think is more important than asking the question, oh, what exactly does the law say about whether or not we have the right to do this? Because unfortunately, I think most of the law right now is stacked on the other side. Now, let me talk about the brick and mortar problem and then move on to the next alternative. Brick and mortar problem is this, and a lot of people don't understand the law. Let me give it to you. If I was out to organize this building, if people worked here, I have to organize this building. I have to define who the workplace is, and it's defined by brick and mortar. It's not defined by workers. It's by defined by location. So if we had another part of this company that was three blocks away, we would have to argue in, before a labor judge that those people and these folks had something in common. Otherwise, and they would turn around perhaps that they're, they're so far away that they're not the same workforce, they're not the same workplace, okay? So we get into, under labor law, this whole notion of brick and mortar. We organize buildings, and it means that you, you establish jurisdiction over the building, which means that some of the original GM buildings had 10,000 people, and today the UAW still has jurisdiction over that same brick and mortar, and today there's 500 people where there used to be 10,000. Okay? We forgot that you have to organize people. No matter if those people get laid off and go elsewhere, you follow those people where they go. And you say, brother and sister, you are still a union member, <coughs> even if you no longer reside in the building where it used to be. Okay? Jurisdiction, unfortunately, under the law is about brick and mortar. So let's go with the second alternative. It's all about social movements and, and uh, coalitions. So who joins unions? What do we know about the people who join unions? The strongest propensity to join unions is among African-American women. They have the strongest yes 
when it comes to actually standing up and voting to, to join unions. Then it goes on to uh, other African Americans, women, Latinos. So what a very strong uh, push has been made in the labor movement, frankly, is to really recognize what's the demographic that we need to... So if African American women are the demographic, and if they're the backbone of a variety of workplaces, that's about organizing within church as well as organizing within community as well as organizing within workplace. And to really try to go with a more social movement feel than it is than simply standing outside of someone's workplace saying, do you want to sign a union card to be part of uh, who we are? Therefore, it's about identity and solidarity. It's about who is us anyway? You know, what does it mean to be a worker? Who is my brother and sister? Who am I really responsible to? Um, now, what beat us in, I use the 2004 elections just because of the fact that it's the one that sticks so much in my mind. You know, uh, getting uh, uh, Bush reelected just put a stake right through my heart. Um, and there was a huge article that was written on Timken workers in Ohio. And those Timken workers, their plant was closing. The jobs are being shipped out, and all of them were voting for George Bush. And the reason they were voting for George Bush, because they said it was about guns, it was about abortion, it was about prayer in schools. What beats us in elections, and what often beats us other times when we try to stand together, is when people can cleave us politically along those kind of lines, and not have people recognize that they have to have solidarity because the minute that someone can pit against each other based on religion, based on feelings about guns, based on feelings about abortion or school fair, you name it, uh, we end up losing, as we have in a number of different elections. Now, that really says that if you're going to organize, you have to organize very strongly around economic self-interest. That's what lost us the 2004 election. All of those other issues took us, diverted us away from where we needed to be, which is, was around issues of uh, economic self-interest. Now, the reason I put international solidarity on this is an interesting figure that um, one of the big things that a lot of us don't recognize, you know, every time I'm in South Africa, it, it slaps me in the face. We have it unbelievably well in America. Every time we talk about poverty in America, our poorest are richer than, uh, than the majority of the world's poor. And uh, the statistic I was looking at earlier today, uh, one out of every three youth in the world between the ages of 17 and 24 is unemployed. No, is, is employed. So, uh, no, it's, yeah, two out, of, two out of every three are actually looking for work between the ages of 17 and 24. So you go into some nations like South Africa, you know, you're talking about uh, unemployment rates upwards of 50 to 60 to 70 percent among that age group. That's a ticking time bomb in a lot of different nations uh, across the world. International solidarity often has meant that we in America ask others to stand up for our strikes, and we don't understand what it means to really stand up for their uh, struggles. I think it's important that we put into perspective that if you're my friend today because you're backing back in my struggle, I need to really understand how I can back yours. Whether it be the plight of Coca-Cola workers in Guatemala, whether it be the, the public sector workers in South Africa, or among other places. Now, associational unionism is all about worker centers. Worker centers and other uh, unique kind of organizing styles, different alternatives that are being promoted, are an alternative to traditional organizing where you're organizing brick and mortar. The tough thing is that it's hard to, and my hat goes off to all of you in the workers' center, it is hard to organize and actually make associational unionism work because the fact that trying to raise money to have, uh, whether it be pay the rent and pay the lights, whether it's doing other kinds of things, Worker centers, by their very nature, are ephemeral in relation to uh, their ability to affect things long-term, unless 
more and more people gain the understanding that this is something that we can do and we can actually have a huge effect in our communities. But there's a lot of interest in what the kind of stuff you're doing, and I applaud it. Now, the power of social media, or as I put here, tweet to the street, it's amazing what's happened the last couple of years. The ability to have an event right now. Take our friends in the, you know, back in the labor holiday. All they would have had to do with cell phones is tweet and say, move now to here, move now to here. And they would have been able to make sure those those ROTC boys didn't throw that many of them into the river. Uh, in, in this <laughs> now, the third alternative often is talked about is that the future is in cooperation. So the question is, who's the enemy? Okay. And there are corporations that would argue that the enemy is the competition. That is, if you're a Ford worker, the, en the enemy is a GM worker because you're both trying to sell to the same consumer. Now, this gets into the whole issue, really, about localism. Because all suffering is local. I can promise you, if, if your plant is going to close versus somebody else's plant, you know, you really hope that theirs closes and yours doesn't. Okay? That's what's going on across the world as plants are forced to compete against one another. So one of the arguments that gets made in this scenario is that there needs to be closer cooperation between labor and management as a way to defend themselves against the real competition, which happens to be whether it be the Chinese or Chrysler or you, you fill in the blank. Last but not least, the fourth alternative that, that I hear all the time, I don't put a lot of stock in it, but I hear a lot about this thing that the reason that the 30s worked is because they were so at the bottom. And that if things really get bad enough, that we very well may see kind of an unbelievable outpouring of revolutionary fervor and all of this will come up again. Uh, when I was a student of revolution, I always read the text that told me that people don't revolt when things are at their worst. They revolt when things are getting better but not fast enough. Okay. Now, I think the problem is that you cannot wait for somehow some new depression to make uh, uh, trade unionism possible. Uh, one thing that's true about the 1930s is a great amount of seeds were planted in the 1920s that took uh, root and were able to really blossom in the 1930s. Uh, some of the stuff you're doing at the worker center, some of the stuff we're trying to do for labor ed and, and elsewhere, I think that we have to put seeds in place if we believe that there very well may be different kind of events that might allow those seeds to take place, to take strong root and to actually you know, come to fruit later. I do believe that the future is about organizing differently. I, again, I applaud what all of you are doing in the worker center. I think that we've got some possibilities of turning around doing the right thing, but it's going to, as Alice was told by the Red Queen, as you remember in Alice in Wonderland, it was a comment on the rotation of the earth, but it's also a comment on uh, trade unionism. Alice was told that you have to run as fast as you possibly can to stay in the same place, and twice as fast if you can get in the You face a daunting task, but then again, we've been a, uh, we've been a strong and, and uh, vibrant movement for a long time. With that, I'll open it to questions for all of us, from all of you, and comments as well. Thanks for coming.